this is the webinar on strengthening family and caregiving environments. So that's standard 16 within the child protection minimum standards. I'm just going to start by inviting the other panelists uh, to introduce themselves. So maybe, um, Kellen, as I can see you straight away, would you like to come on briefly and just uh, say hello to everyone? Yes. So my name is Kellen Kiraithe. I'm a social worker in Tushinda Children Trust. And I'll be among the panelists. Just I'll share a brief um, uh, PowerPoints that I have with you guys. And um, if you're going to know more about Tushinda later after presenting the PowerPoint. Hey, everyone. I'm Sarah Hummel. I'm the director for MHPSS at um, the Department of Education and Child Protection at Save the Children's uh, International Programs Department in Washington, DC. Hi, I'm Eva Smullegange. I'm the Global Psychosocial Support Specialist at War Child uh, Holland, and I'm based in Amsterdam. Hi, everybody. It's Joanna Wedge. I work for UNICEF as the co-chair of the Child Protection Minimum Standards Working Group at the global level, along with Susanna, and I'm based in Toronto, Canada. Thanks, Joanna. So these are all of our lovely panelists. So with, uh, with apologies, I think we're all going to turn our videos off now. And Ava and Sarah will shortly take you through the, the details of that standard, which is a new standard in the 2019 edition. But I wanted to take the liberty of just taking a couple of minutes to briefly share with those of you who may be less familiar, the 2019 edition of the Child Protection Minimum Standards. So as most, if not all of you might know, we recently went through a two-year highly participatory revision process of the minimum standards. And the new minimum standards were launched in October of last year in English. And the French and Spanish versions have recently come out and are all available online. And the Arabic is, is coming out in the next few weeks. But we just wanted to share with you the overview that the 2019 edition is the same sort of CPMS that you know and love, but updated with the latest evidence and operational experience about what is most effective um, and applicable approaches to child protection in a range of humanitarian settings. And we were able to incorporate experience and make sure that the new edition of the standards was applicable in refugee and displacement contexts, and I think really importantly for all of us right now in infectious disease settings. So lots of learning that came out of the West African Ebola crisis, out of emergency responses in contexts that had cholera and SARS and many others were able to be integrated into this edition. And so that icon that you see at the bottom of your screen right now, you will find throughout the CPMS now highlighting um, key specific actions in infectious disease settings. And Sarah and Abel will share some of that with you that's applicable to, to standard 16 on strengthening family and caregiving environments. There are a number of other changes and I won't go through all of them right now, but just highlight some of the big lines that the new edition really has a strong emphasis on our partnership with local actors. And you will find kind of evidence through of that throughout, particularly an emphasis on working with national NGOs as well as governments and being sure that we're kind of in line with the grand bargain and localization agenda. There's also a strength and emphasis on accountability to children. So both through better guidance on child safeguarding and protection from sexual exploitation and abuse throughout, but also with emphasis on different ways to facilitate child participation throughout the standards. There's also a big feedback that we received from kind of country level consultations was the need for comprehensive, measurable and realistic indicators. Those are included in the handbook itself, as well as in a menu of indicators which has been added as an annex. You'll similarly see this prevention icon at the bottom. There was a lot of work done to be sure the standards included not only kind of preparedness and response, but also actions that were trying to prevent child protection harms. And last but not least, pillar four, which is our pillar about working across sectors now includes integrated approaches. So moving beyond just mainstreaming child protection actions into other sectors work, but really working towards joint programming 
and respecting kind of the growing evidence on the impact of that the centrality of protection is really uh, the goal and the aim of the majority of humanitarian action and the negative impact when sectoral programming is blind to child protection. So that's my very brief introduction to the CPMS. If you're interested in learning more, you can visit the Alliance website and we'll also share our email addresses and the ways to contact the CPMS working group as well as the Family Strengthening Task Force at the end of this webinar. But with that, I shall hand it over to Ava and Sarah to begin presenting Standard 16. Okay, hey, thank you. Hello, everyone. Just a, a quick note to let you know that we, because the standard is guidance for how we develop appropriate strategies and approaches for real life programming, we are going to do our best to go over it as quickly as possible so that we have more time to hear from all of you about your examples of things that are working and not working in the field about current challenges related to COVID-19, how you're addressing those challenges and, and have a forum where we can really share real life experience as it's unfolding about what's going well and what's not going well so that we can learn from each other's experiences and best practices. So we look forward to hearing from all of you in the second half of the webinar. Let's start with standard 16. So standard 16 for family strengthening is part of the CPMS that falls into standards to develop adequate strategies. And if you look to the left here, you'll see the standards that come just before and just after. And I'd just like to draw our attention to the fact that everything that precedes and proceeds standard 16 is actually directly relevant because what we're trying to do is have a really holistic approach that takes into consideration many different stakeholders, many different avenues for strengthening caregiver and household and, and family caregiving environments and doing all of that through a socio-ecological model with a systems thinking approach. As many of you are probably familiar with the socio-ecological model, it's intended to provide a framework that supports systems thinking for child protection programming by looking at an entire situation. Um, so identifying all of the different elements and factors um, and understanding how they relate and interact with each other in a specific context. So rather than looking at a single protection issue or a specific service on its own, we're looking at the entire system and thinking about a full range of problems and challenges facing the child, the family, the household, their root causes, and the solutions that are available at many different levels across many different sectors. So the idea is that we are promoting flexible programming that can integrate new learning and can adapt throughout the implementation process by looking at all of these different levels of what affects a child, a family, and a household. In this regard, um, the socio-ecological model and the child protection systems thinking are intended to be complementary frameworks. And what we're trying to do is seek to achieve a goal of holistic integrated programming and strategies with a three-tiered approach. So we're trying to prepare, prevent, and respond in a way that will support the child, the family, and the caregiving environment. One example of an interagency strategy that very much aligns with this is INSPIRE. And for those of you who, I'm sure most of you are, are quite familiar with INSPIRE, which is a World Health Organization and Global Partnership to End Violence Against Children strategy that includes 10 international agencies. This is an example of a really holistic approach to preparing, preventing, and responding to violence against children in a way that seeks to address all of the different areas of the socio-ecological model through a systems-based approach. 
specifically with seven very key aspects, very key strategies to implementation and enforcement of laws, looking at norms and values that could put children and families at risk, looking at the enabling of safe environments, focusing on parent and caregiver support, addressing income and economic strengthening, having quality programming and response for linking children and families with appropriate support services to respond as to risks and vulnerabilities as needed, and focusing on education and life skills as supportive factors to help protect children from violence and respond to their needs once they are affected. We're not going to go into too much detail, but we just wanted to highlight how strong the link is between the standard 16 approach to the socio-ecological model and the systems thinking and INSPIRE. And for those of you who'd like to look at INSPIRE in more detail, um, there is a 2016 and 2018 WHO publication, World Health Organization publication, as well as the website through the Global Partnership to End Violence Against Children, which is www.end-violence.org forward slash INSPIRE. Okay, so moving on, just some basic foundation for the standard 16 is our understanding that children that are affected by conflict and or crisis face multiple threats to their physical and psychological well-being and yet children are resilient and so understanding that numerous protective factors are well known to support resilience we want to focus on specific factors that can be supported to enable an environment that supports children's recovery and resilience. So caring and protective environments, responsive and supportive caregivers within those environments, and healthy caregiving, caregiver to child relationships within the household and the caregiving environment. Important to note that caregivers play a significant role in strengthening children's capacity to cope with stressful situations, particularly in humanitarian settings, but they can also be a great source of risk as their caregiver capacity can be limited by their own experiences of distress and adversity during conflict, disaster, displacement, or another crisis. Thus, the holistic approach to supporting from many different angles across many different areas of the model. So standard 16, as it is defined, is that family and caregiving environments are strengthened to promote children's healthy development and to protect them from maltreatment and other negative effects of adversity. It's important to note that the caregiving environment here is defined as the child's unique, direct, physical, and human living arrangement and that caregiving includes both formal legal arrangements as well as informal arrangements in which the caregiver does not necessarily have legal responsibility of the child. It's also important to note that we're defining an immediate caregiver as a person with whom the child lives and who provides daily care to the child. An immediate caregiver is responsible for three core things, meeting the child's physical, emotional, social, cognitive, and spiritual needs, developing a consistent and caring relationship with the child, and protecting the child from harm. Through the standard, we aim to strengthen the capacity of the caregiver and strengthen the caregiving environment through preparedness, prevention, and response. So let's start with preparedness. It is very, very important for us to understand the cultural beliefs about family, parenting, raising children, and to look at the existing social norms and practices that serve to protect or endanger children. It is also very important to assess the impact of the humanitarian crisis. We know that many families are vulnerable before the crisis sets in, 
and that the crisis exacerbates these vulnerabilities. So understanding both the before, during, and after is critical. Also important that as we prepare is a mapping of the existing services that support families and the way that those services are able to adapt to the onset of shocks or new crisis. And planning a comprehensive family strengthening prevention and response program that relies on this key preparedness approach on the mapping, on the existing services, on ways to improve quality and re improve the way that we're supporting on through many different avenues of entry with the child and the family and the household is critical. We very much want to focus here on family systems, on community systems, on the roles and responsibilities of adults and children based on the various societal norms and specifically to look at new and existing positive and or negative coping mechanisms that develop as a result of the crisis. When we're looking at ways to prevent and preparing for prevention, our intention is to identify, develop, contextualize and adapt evidence-based family strengthening interventions for the local setting and different caregiving environments. We also are aiming to train multi-sectoral actors to appropriately identify and refer caregivers who need support and to raise the caregiver's awareness of strategies for preventing negative coping mechanisms. It's very important that throughout both the preparedness and the prevention, we are involving children, caregivers, and multiple stakeholders across multiple sectors throughout this process. We also want to be uh, sure that we are promoting the appropriate identification, outreach, and inclusion of vulnerable families in the existing condition who are then made increasingly vulnerable by the crisis as this complexity plays out and multiplies the vulnerabilities that put the child and the family at risk. As we look at our key actions for response, we want to specifically focus on how we implement interventions that strengthen caregivers' mental health, psychosocial well-being, and parenting skills. We know that if the parent or caregiver, him or herself, is in distress, his or her ability to respond to the needs of the child or the children in the household will be diminished. So we start with a focus on the caregiver and then on the caregiver's ability to support others. There are many ways in which we can do this through the socio-ecological model, specifically through strengthening caregivers' social networks, but we want to be sure that we're doing that in a way that is intentional and identifying gaps in the caregiver's resources and skills that would be strengthened by an intentional social network where we can bring together people who are able to support each other in an intentional way that has positive results for their households. This can be through supporting or establishing social groups, peer-to-peer -peer support groups, self-help groups, or alternative communication mechanisms um, through social media that can bring, or, or through telephone or WhatsApp or different types of communication mechanisms that can bring people together and foster positive communication and engagement. We also want to ensure that we're providing targeted support to families, caregivers, and child heads of household so that they are able to learn and apply positive parent caregiving practices, that they're able to improve their caregiver to child relationship, and that they're able to engage in appropriate self-care. It's very important that we highlight the fact that in many cases, we are addressing the needs of child-headed households, um, that strategies don't only look at a household, a head of household as an adult, so that we are able to identify the best way to support the family 
and to refer them to the appropriate multi-sectoral services and provide direct supports, whether those are social supports, economic supports, education supports, health supports, et cetera. Okay, a quick note on indicators for evaluation. Now, we know that there is a lot of discussion and debate that's very interesting and exciting around measurement, both monitoring and evaluation, and appropriate indicators for research around all aspects of child and family well-being and how to measure appropriately improvements to the household environment. These indicators are meant to be very gentle, and we're not necessarily endorsing any specific tool or measurement approach. And we would be very happy to hear from all of you and to hear about some of the ways that you have adapted these indicators and used different measurement strategies and used different tools. And this is something that we are directly linking with our colleagues that are focusing through the Alliance on, on the Research Task Force. So this could potentially be the subject of a future webinar where we can delve in more detail. But let's go over the three indicators. The first one is that we're looking at the percentage of targeted caregivers who report an increased knowledge of caring and protective behaviors toward children under their care following their participation in a family strengthening program. And the target here would be a 90% reporting that increased knowledge. The second is the percent of targeted caregivers reporting enhanced skills to fulfill their responsibilities toward their children following their participation in the program. And again, we're looking for a 90% report of enhanced skills. And the third is the percent of children between the ages of eight to 17 who report a positive change in their interactions with their caregivers following their caregivers' participation in strengthening, in family strengthening programming. Again, looking for a 90%. All of these indicators are suggested to be disaggregated by sex, age, disability, and other relevant diversity factors. They are intended to measure progress against the overall standard. And the indicators and targets should be or can be contextualized with the goal of meeting the indicated targets across all three. There are additional indicators that are available online. I will say that we've had an interesting discussion within the Alliance and within the Family Strengthening Task Force around these indicators and around the tools that are used to measure them. And there's a lot of pro and con to both qualitative and quantitative measures. Um, many agencies look at sort of uh, qualitative measurements that are done at end line that are reflective of the experience of participating in the program, whether those are key informant interviews or focus groups. Some do quantitative measurement with a pre and post before and after intervention, which can measure change over time. Some of this could be a, a CAP survey, looking at knowledge, attitudes, and practices, specifically about the, the caregiving environment and about the skills to respond to children's needs in a positive way in the caregiving environment. And all of these are, are good and appropriate measures in different contexts. So it's very important to ensure that when we're looking to design evaluation or, and we're looking to choose appropriate tools, that we're really thinking through what is most appropriate to the local context, to the local environment, to ensure that we are taking the right approach to not do any harm and to collect the most relevant information in the most safe and supportive way. Okay, a few guidance notes on how we sort of take our next steps, what we actually do to operationalize the standard. So we want to look at the approaches and methods of interventions. We specifically want to look at evidence that encourages the use of different methods through different entry points, whether those are entry points at different 
at different areas of the socio-ecological model or entry points through different sectors, through different responses where we are interacting with the caregivers and with the household through uh, nutrition programming, social programming, health programming, education programming, through social work approaches that directly target the household or are through other community forums and various mechanisms. We also want to look at positive parenting interventions that are associated with positive mental and social outcomes for children. We also want to call attention to the need for engaging male caregivers. There's an overwhelming amount of evidence that demonstrates the incredibly positive impact of male caregiver engagement on children's social, educational, behavioral, and psychological outcomes. A lot of these examples include creating champions for male caregiver engagement through community and cultural mechanisms, such as through mosque or church, or through sports clubs or other similar approaches. We also want to carefully consider the most vulnerable households. Households that are particularly at risk, including child-headed households and households that meet locally defined risk criteria before the crisis sets in. And ensuring that our strategies prioritize these households for more intensive targeted response as appropriate. And we also want to make sure that we're considering all members of the family. We're looking at not only the adult and or child caregivers within the family, but all of the children and other members of the household that play a role in strengthening the overall well-being of the household and supportive environment for children. We also want to take into consideration how our guidance specifically adapts to foster families. We want to ensure that we're adapting family strengthening interventions to respond to the specific needs of children who are in foster care and the specific needs of those caregivers. We want to ensure that the capacity building for the family strengthening workforce is a key focal point of these strategies, that our ability to train and support various family strengthening actors to address families' vulnerabilities and risks across many different sectors is not only at the outset of the strategy, but is also something that we revisit, that we're constantly um, readdressing, adapting our approaches to new shocks, to new challenges as they arise, and continuing capacity building so that our workforce is able to adapt and adjust as appropriate. We also want to ensure that there is appropriate focus on economic support within our strategies, specific interventions that can be integrated into, uh, into community case management, into so various social work approaches, linking with economic services such as cash transfers, food vouchers, et cetera, that we know are going to help strengthen the overall environment of the household. And Last, we want to ensure that we have a key focus on advocacy, that we are coordinating with all relevant actors across all sectors to advocate for greater family and caregiving focused interventions, working with government, community leaders, families, donors, and other key stakeholders. Okay, before we wrap up on this, just a few reflections on specific risks that we have seen arise because of COVID-19. Some of the risks that we're seeing children and, and families facing at this time are increased risk of violence and child abuse within the home due to the increased psychosocial distress amongst caregivers, increased family tensions within the home as a result of the geographical or logistical conditions of the response where children are out of school, they're out of organized, structured, supportive environments outside the household, spending more time in the household um, with family members that are also not able to leave the household to engage in their normally, normal daily activities. We're also seeing reduced supervision and neglect of children as children are out of those, those structured caregiving environments during the day, out of school, out of CFS, 
back in the home and or the caregivers in the home are focused on more immediate needs of uh, economic support or health support in light of COVID-19. We're also seeing a loss of caregivers or separation from caregivers due to the actual illness itself or the quarantine measures. And we have a, a few suggestions. Now, this is not an exhaustive list. Of course, neither is this an exhaustive li list of the risks that we're currently facing because of COVID-19, nor is this an exhausted an exhaustive list of suggested interventions to address these risks, but some of it focuses on awareness raising to prevent family separation, providing remote MHPSS support to caregivers, as well as remote MHPSS support to the workforce that is supporting families in this time, remote parenting skills support to caregivers, maintaining case management interventions for the high-risk cases, often which has to maintain face-to-face -face contact, but can be complemented by um, phone or text or other remote mechanisms that can help with the reporting and the referrals, but making sure that we have enough of that, the real face-to-face -face case management approach available for the, for the cases that need it. And also the distribution of psychosocial support kits for children um, who are in quarantine, ways of helping children and parents engage in positive, constructive activities in the home, either for the, for the children to do on their own or for children and caregivers to do together. Okay, uh, thank you very much. Uh, I'm going to pause here and hand over to Kellen, who's going to give us some examples from Tushinda about their work in Nairobi, both their standard family strengthening support programming, as well as some lessons learned from how they have adapted that programming to the context of COVID-19. Thanks very much, Sarah. This is Susanna. Kellen, uh, please go ahead. I'll switch over to your slides now. Join again. We can transition it back to her. I'm working as the country director at Tushinde in Nairobi, Kenya. I'm currently in the United States, be familiar with these slides, and I helped Kellen in, de in developing them. So the first few slides are really just a background of um, who Tushinde is and what we do in terms of family strengthening and child protection. We are a small NGO in Nairobi, and the other is called PMBU. We began in 2010 um, working with very vulnerable families in Mathare and, and recently expanded into the sectors about the number of families that we work with and their children. We have um, field visits in the homes with these vulnerable families that are in crisis and we work with so sorry, Laurie, it, it seems like you're, you're coming in and out a bit as well. Um, and I think that we have um, Kellen uh, joining back. Uh. So Shinda means succeeding in Swahili. Uh, we, it was founded in 2010 to support children living in absolute poverty. Uh, they are being in two locations, that is Matare and also in Kembiu. Matare being the second largest informal settlement in Nairobi, both known as slum. Our vision is to assist children or help children realize their rights to protection and development. We are registered in NGO as NGO in Kenya and are also registered in the UK as a charity. Currently, we are 19 employees. We have seven community health volunteers and we are working with 12 mentors. Our annual budget is $331,000. So who is Tushinde? That is who we are. So what do we do? Uh, we identify and enroll families that are in crisis. Uh, we support them where necessary until they are able uh, to stand on their own. This is to be independent. So currently we have enrolled uh, 97 families uh, in Matare and uh, 30 families in Kembiu. We, we are working with this family holistically just to ensure that children are able to uh, uh, go to school without any challenges. So um, our family support program, this is what we actually major with in Tushinde. We provide psychosocial support. This is coming from uh, the social workers doing a regular follow-up, a regular home visit to these clients, knowing what they are going through, what are the challenges that they are facing, how do we come in, 
and how do we assist? We also do referrals. We have partners like um, the medical uh, services, medical health institutions like our schools. So in case we want more intervention on a case, we can refer these cases to them. We also work uh, in handy with the uh, CHPs, uh, being that work with us in uh, maybe monitoring and uh, following up the red flag cases. Red flag cases being that they need much of our attention, they need more of our time. So they just work with us to ensure that these red flag cases come from that phase to another better phase. We also work with mentors. Mentors are coming in to assist our beneficiaries to identify uh, available resources for them to be able to achieve their set goals. Uh, we do emergency uh, support, that is in housing. Uh, housing being that maybe a client is unable to pay their rent, that's when we come in. We do medical expenses if they are overwhelmed with the bill. We do funders being that most of our caregivers, um, when they are enrolled, most of them sleep on the ground. So in, uh, for us to curb any uh, chances of them getting sick, we provide or we purchase bed or beddings for them, just for them to have that comfortable at least life. We also do ca weekly cash transfer, being that most of our caregivers are they are casual workers, so today they get the job, tomorrow they might not get the job. So this uh, weekly cash transfer is to enable them at least get the basic needs and uh, just have that at least comfortable life. And uh, we also enroll uh, children and their caregivers to National Health Insurance Fund. This is um, paid by Tushine, just to allow them have an easy uh, access to medical services without any hassle. We provide school fee and school supplies to those kids that we are working with, those who are, we have sponsored and those who are in our program. We may in trainings like uh, child protection, uh, trainings, lifestyle training, business trainings, and also with parenting training to caregivers, just to enable them um, relate well with the community and also with their children. We do uh, referrals. This can be medical or social services because we have partners our partners in uh, social uh, in in the community uh, being that uh, we work with the they're called children protection offices uh, in case we are overwhelmed in case we need more intervention in a case or a, on a case then we can refer these cases to them we are happy to have achieved 50 percent of our beneficiaries who have graduated uh, from business training uh, this is making it better for them that their monthly income has doubled because they are able to venture out and concentrate on other economic opportunities. We are also happy that 93% of our beneficiaries are enrolled in national health insurance cover. Like I said, this is making it easy for them to assess medical services without any challenges. We are also happy that in 2017, we had an expansion of another program that is in Kiambiu. And we are doing more of the same, what we are doing in Matharet, in assisting vulnerable children, those who are living in absolute poverty. Also, we are seeing an improvement in social work assessment data in all domains, being that we have 10 key domains. These are physical health, that they are able now to assess uh, health facilities without any challenges. The, uh, the second domain is well being. When they are stressed, are they able to? have relevant people to go and talk to? Are they meeting the emotional needs of their children? Keeping safe, are they able to protect their family? Are they able to tell their children where to go and places to avoid? And net uh, social uh, social networking, are they able to relate well with society, with the community? If maybe they are in trouble, are they able to call a neighbor to come help them out? Another domain is in education, now that Tushinde is paying for their school fee. Parents or caregivers able to encourage their children to constantly be in school and not out of school. In boundaries and behavior, that is another domain. Is the family following the family guidelines? Uh, do they know what to do? Do they know the do's and the don'ts? In family routines, are they able to have that bonding time to eat together? maybe do chores together. In home and money, this is another domain. Is the caregiver able to manage his finances? Are they able to pay rent on time? Are they able to 
provide basic needs for their families on time. The last domain is progress to work. This being that most of our caregivers have gone through the training that we are giving them. Are they able to go and assess or venture out in, on other economic opportunities like getting employed or maybe starting off their own businesses? So this is, this we are happy for the achievement that we have achieved over the decade. So on our next slide, we are going to see the impact of COVID-19. Uh, being that we have been hit hard uh, with the pandemic, like just like any other organizations. And uh, we were able to do data, collect data just to see, or just to assess the impact of the, of the pandemic. And uh, we were able to come to the point that most of our caregivers have lost their jobs. They are not working, so they are unable to pay rent. They are also unable to buy food. Students are not going to school, being that uh, now just to protect them, they have to be at home. We are going to see an increase in mental health concern, being that now the caregivers are not going to work and uh, they have children who are looking up upon them to provide certain uh, things for them. And uh, we are going to see an increase in child protection uh, concerns and also in GBV. Uh, an example being that now we are going to see an advantage of children being in school. Now because of COVID-19, they are forced to be at home. Mother, uh, a case, I was working on a case whereby a mother was I had abused uh, his child by se by sending him to go buy illicit uh, liquor, that is illegal alcohol. We noticed this and we work with uh, the local authorities and the matters, the matter was, and uh, the family was enrolled in cash transfer just to make them have the basic need instead of going out and uh, abusing other children's maybe rights for them to gain, uh, for their selfish gain or to gain something to maybe assist or provide for their families. So this, uh, the impact of the COVID-19. Moving on, uh, Tushinde has been on the front line to ensure that uh, it's protecting its staffs. Now we are encouraged to use private means of transportation instead of public means of transportation. We have a uh, a crew, a skeleton crew that is coming in the office just to ensure that there is a smooth running of the program. Most of us are working from home just for us to adhere to the 1.5, let's say two meter rule from each other. Not forgetting our uh, community health volunteers, we have provided protective gears for them just for them to have an easy time while working. So meeting our beneficiaries need this is the time that we are going to see caregiving ability being undermined, whereby the caregivers are not able to provide for their families. But uh, thanks to Tushinde, we came in and uh, we have started providing food packages to these families. We are doing housing support for those who are unable to pay their rent or for those who are at the verge of being evicted. And uh, also we are using the case management model, giving them psychosocial support referring them to relevant agencies, like if they want to, there's a mental uh, health issue, maybe we refer them to our counselor or refer them to medical facilities. This they can get from our partners or they can also use their cards to just have uh, the services or the support they need at this particular time. Just like any other program, Tushinde has adapted the new norm and uh, now instead of doing physical home visits, we are encouraged to do basic on check-ins just to know how our caregivers are faring, uh, what are the challenges are they facing, how do we come in, how do we assist. Uh, the team, uh, we are now, thanks to technology now, team is doing uh, meetings remotely that is via Skype or what we are doing right now. And also we can see that there's an increase in responsibilities when it comes to this HV. So th these are individuals that are living in these uh, communities so they are able to follow up on red flag cases, um, maybe do a regular phone follow up and uh, liaise with the social workers on interventions that they're going to give to the red flag cases. 
Uh, we are working uh, in collaboration with the funders just to reallocate the funds to emergency as it is needed right now. In summary, we are happy that we are continuing to support these families during this crisis and also uh, the staffs and the CHP, we have quickly and successfully adapted UAS. The new norm now, instead now of doing things that we used to do uh, previously, we have accepted the new norm and we're working effectively towards achieving Tushinde's goal. We are also lucky to have a flexible and supportive uh, funders who are really reliable at this time and we are grateful for that. Uh, if this continues, we are at risk of losing uh, the progress gained over the last decade. Being that most of our caregivers had started their own businesses and uh, right now they are forced to be in their houses, they cannot access their, their, their businesses, they cannot go to work. So these are businesses that were funded by Tushinde. So if this continue then we are at a risk of seeing this getting lost. And also there will be an added level of crisis if people begin to get sick. We are going to see an increase uh, in support whereby initially the support was, let's say it was not that big, but for now we're going to see that there's going to be a triple uh, increase need support to our caregivers now that they're not working or going to their businesses. In conclusion, I am grateful for everyone giving me, lending me their ears. Thank you so much. Now welcome Q&A. Not only me, I know that the country director is around and also the executive director is around. So if you have any question, kindly, con kindly contribute. We are going to give you us. We are going to give you our feedback. If at all your question comes a little bit late, kindly contact us in the contact information below and we are going to reach back to you. Thank you. Thanks, Kellen, so much for that really informative and also super timely presentation. I think it's it's really amazing to hear how you've adapted and as well as how you're able to continue to collaborate with your community health volunteers. So we are amazingly relatively on time and we have about 30 minutes left in the webinar. We have a few questions in the Q&A that I'll start reading out. So the first one is talking about um, when we're talking about a community worker or a social worker, about how how many families can they work with, kind of given the um, given the challenges that there are right now. Um, I know within the CPMS we often talk about twenty five cases for each caseworker being the, the maximum, but please feel free, other panelists um, and, and participants on the call, if you'd like to, to comment on this question. I think there's been a lot of adaptation um, happening over the last few weeks because of COVID-19 that has influenced the caseload for a lot of case management and social workers um, in the field. Some of that is due to new online or um, telephone reporting mechanisms um, where a lot of the, the, the assessment and referral mechanism in some cases is able to be done remotely. Um, in other cases, obviously, though, there's still a need for that one-on-one -on -one interaction between the social worker uh, or case management worker and the caregiver, child, or family. So I think that, that the standard guidance that we have is very useful, but there's obviously a, a very expansive um, range of what is now appropriate based on the new technology that's, that's being used in terms of remote services. Thanks a lot, Sarah. The next question that, that we have in the Q&A, how can we reach young people right now um, with the with the actual op obstacles? So especially with with lockdown um, and less freedom of movement uh, because of COVID nineteen. Um, it'd be great to hear. Um, we heard the great example from Tushinde about how they're working through their community health volunteers. Um, it would be great to hear examples from others. Uh, particularly. For us, uh, Save the Children, I work for Save the Children, Nigeria. 
uh, what uh, we uh, adapted in uh, Nigeria is um, looking at uh, the lockdown that uh, the government have uh, imposed. So uh, there are several strategies we've been using to reach out to uh, children in the community, uh, distressed or children that are at risk of um, abuse or children who uh, might need uh, support. What we're looking at is um, strengthening capacities of uh, uh, workers, particularly uh, volunteers who stay in the community, uh, community volunteers who reside in the community. Uh, virtually, uh, that's uh, using the remote uh, uh, system to build their capacities to uh, identify uh, the space and how they can work closely with uh, families and the community to uh, address some of the challenges uh, they might be facing. But um, the, uh, one of the greatest challenges we're facing is uh, particularly uh, the lockdown, which is hindering uh, vol community volunteers to access uh, services that might not be there in the community coming out of, from the community to access uh, these services is, uh, is a big uh, challenge, especially if uh, they are immediate need. But uh, for cases that would require uh, the support of the community structures, like for example, the PPCs and also some community structures, and also services that are readily available in the community, uh, the community health, uh, the community and volunteers, work directly with the students. That is in terms of uh, particular case management. For uh, the psychosocial support, the lockdown has really uh, halted all activities which uh, were not doing anything currently as to judge that. But uh, upon the resumption or when uh, this uh, lockdown is relaxed, uh, we can have, there will be uh, an approach whereby the these uh, CFS uh, volunteers or animators will have, uh, there's going to be a strategy where they work hand in hand with the caregivers to, 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 to provide the psychosocial support. We in Save the Children provide the material and also the necessary uh, technical uh, backstop for this uh, community. Uh, volunteer. Thanks very think, much, Ishola. Oh. It's, it's it's sorry. It's it's great to hear your to hear your experience and especially to hear um, the the work you're continuing to do with community volunteers just despite the challenges. If I can move to the next question, it's for Kellen. It's asking how is Tushinde able to sustain the commitment of community volunteers to do home visits, even with the risks that they may face because of COVID-19? Are they being given incentives or are there, are there other um, elements uh, that are being used? The community volunteers, we've been working with them even before this pandemic. And uh, they have volunteers, these are individuals that are working in this or actually living in these areas. So they are able to follow up or maybe check in on red flag cases, not all cases, but only red flag cases, by maybe following up via, it's not necessarily for them to do home visits, but they can also do a phone follow up. They are also following the guidelines, the government directive on how to be safe. So they are constantly working with us, not that they are, give it, they are given any um, in incentives right now, but they are actually encouraging because they are the people who are in the front line to create awareness to these people on how to prevent themselves from COVID-19. So they are taking that opportunity also to follow up on these cases. So I think Lori can also add in, Lori or Megan can also add in. I'll just read out a couple of, of comments that have come in response. I've seen a, a message from, from Lori um, basically just, just echoing what you said, Kellen, that they're using phone calls and kind of your established relationships with the, with the community volunteers. And I see a, a message from our colleague Innocent in Rwanda, who's uh, saying they are similarly relying on existing community volunteers and, and networks of, 
of community members uh, to follow up on cases and that they're still able to provide some cash transfers through phone and direct phone calls for psychosocial support and that there is they're using some text messaging so sms's with a focus on reaching children with disabilities within the community so trying to use the technology that they have to to reach and support families this is a question from innocent from hope and homes for children um, who's asking i think particularly asking sarah how to increase consideration for the social workforce they have limited access or facilities to make interventions with children families and communities during the crisis asking the will the social service workforce will whether they'll be allowed to come in um, only when the current crisis is contained and how to cope when they're kind of not able to provide some of the essential services that they usually do. I'm happy to respond very briefly based on um, some of the local adaptations that I have heard from some of our partners in the field, um, which include that in many cases, such as uh, what we've just heard from Tushinda, there is still some of the social workforce um, carrying on in normal logistical aspects of their work, still meeting and visiting families and households face to face. Um, and in supporting them to do so, it's, it's very important to be re providing them with the type of protective gear that is um, needed to help protect them from infection also important to provide them with appropriate um, psychosocial support for themselves as they're working in very high stress conditions. Um, the other is that um, in addition to the, the workforce that is still active, um, to supplement that in a lot of cases, we are seeing um, these remote services or rem remote intake and referrals taking place. Some of the services that the social workforce would normally refer people to are still active. Those um, through protection, legal mechanisms, uh, medical services, um, in many cases those are still um, happening. A lot of the challenge now is the logistics as local transportation uh, and or um, the financial mechanism to uh, to travel or to access um, might be impeded. Um, but a lot of uh, remote support that we're hearing about includes not only um, intake and referrals by phone or text, um, but also counseling by phone and, um, and, and supporting and responding to questions and concerns um, of caregivers uh, over, over phone counseling to help better support themselves and the children in their household during this time. Thanks very much, uh, Sarah. I think on, in that vein, a, a colleague, uh, Sherman Molinda, had uh, raised, uh, raised their hand. Hello, everybody. Um, my name is Sherman Molinda. I work with Railway Children Africa in Tanzania. One of the things that we've been doing here, um, I'm not sure if I should say fortunately or unfortunately, we are not under lockdown. Um, and so we've been able to position ourselves and advocate with government that um, our workers are part of the essential category of workers um, that need to continue to work. And so we've provided um, a number of protective uh, mechanisms and gear um, to our frontline workers, um, along with guidance on on assessing you know, risk with COVID, on precautions to take. Um, and we've been assessing on a case-by-case -case basis who might need a physical home visit and who might need, you know, who could be okay with just a phone follow-up. So in some circumstances, we are still doing um, physical home visits, especially when um, we have either received information that there has been some concerns. Um, I should probably contextualize. We work with um, street connected children and youth. So especially with those children that perhaps have been newly reunified um, or who are already receiving certain services, it's been especially important for us 
to, um, to, to not just resort to phone follow-up. Also in our context, um, very few people have um, you know, access to the internet. Uh, many of our families don't even have phones. So in some cases, we've even had to buy phones and provide them to families so that we can stay in touch. So those are just some strategies. And I, I know that a number of you guys are in lockdown situation, but I think that it, this is a real opportunity for us to advocate that social workers are actually um, like doctors and nurses, part of protecting lives and part of the essential personnel that need to be out there. So how can we ensure that we can um, ensure that we're protected and still be out there so that we can protect our clients? Thank you very much, Shimon. I think that's that's an excellent example. And um, I will just take the opportunity to underline that um, the Alliance in its own advocacy has very much taken the, the position um, that social workers are just as you say, um, essential workers, just like um, doctors and nurses, and that they should be um, exempted from these movement restrictions in order to continue to following up um, with high risk cases. Um, and I know there have been some great examples um, from field colleagues in Uganda, Lebanon and elsewhere where they've been able to successfully advocate um, with governments to to lift some of those restrictions and allow social workers to to move about in order to follow up high risk cases. So it's really wonderful to hear um, those examples. Um, we do have a few more questions, so I'll try and move us on to some of them. Um, we've got uh, one in the Q and A that's asking. This is from our colleague uh, Julie Villanada, and apologize to anyone if I'm not pronouncing your name correctly. Um, it's asking, are there initiatives that have that specifically target male caregivers to address parental distress brought upon by COVID-19 and the lockdown, the, and the lockdown, excuse me. And if there are, um, can you kind of describe how they are done? Hi, Susanna. This is Ava. Uh, yes, just to reply to um, that question regarding uh, male caregivers. Um, well, I'm from Wartel Holland and what we have developed the past few years is a caregiver support intervention and it's not only um, targeting male caregivers when it comes to distress brought uh, by COVID-19, uh, but parental distress in general and we are adapting it to a more COVID-19 specific session in the Middle East with audio recordings, etc. so that it can also be used by caregivers at home. But what we have tried from the beginning, because we know from a lot of uh, practice and uh, research that often male caregivers are not participating in parenting support uh, interventions. And then one of the conclusions is always to include male caregivers in the next study or in the next intervention. So right from the start, we have been focusing a lot on male caregivers and we're quite successful um, in having them participating from day one till uh, um, finalization of uh, interventions by really <clears throat> also tapping into um, community uh, key uh, facilitators that were very active in reaching out to these male caregivers um, and including topics specifically um, you know, also more appealing to fathers. For example, um, what you would often hear is uh, father saying, you know, it's not as uh, important for me to be involved with the child when it's very young, uh, because, for example, they don't uh, really know a lot at a younger age, but when then providing more scientific information or evidence to these fathers that they find it quite interesting, and also it triggers something in them that they do find it interesting to be more involved in these parenting uh, kind of interventions. Uh, at least that's for our experience how it's uh, been working so far and we're adapting that caregiver support intervention specifically for the Middle Eastern region. We haven't tested it out in different uh, cultural contexts. So if you are interested in hearing more about that, please do feel free to reach out to me um, uh, regarding that. And we will also in the next uh, webinar have probably colleagues from the Middle East presenting on that caregiver support intervention and their whole adaptation towards COVID-19, if that answers a bit. 
Thanks very much, Ava. Um, there, there were some comments in the chat box, one, one that I think has only come through to panelists, so I'll just take the liberty to read it um, aloud. This is from uh, Catherine Bedford, a colleague from Save the Children in Papua New Guinea, who's um, mentioned that there they've had um, SMS and radio announcements, as well as kind of posters and leaflets distributed um, during community awareness sessions, um, kind of including messaging around, ch around child protection, around gender-based violence, parenting, nutrition, and messages specifically adapted for, um, for children and to support them. So I think a range, um, and there have been a, a, a few other comments in the, in the chat box about um, different things that can be included in, in at-home PSS kits. Um, so do have a, have a look there if you haven't already. Um, we don't have very much time left, but I think I will, um, I will try and, and take one more question that we have in the Q&A box. Um, a colleague was just asking about um, how to, to manage the situation, especially when unaccompanied children have been identified and, and may need an in-person follow-up, but um, due to kind of um, weaknesses in the health system in the country involved, uh, frontline workers might have um, really serious concerns about going and physically following up on a case. From my side, I, I, I think that's a really tough one. Um, one of the things that we're, we're seeing um, work more successfully is when when those staff members have access to PPE, when they have um, mechanisms to sort of physically support to protect themselves, um, to put them at, at lower risk of infection, um, and where we're also certain that they have uh, support mechanisms, not only to get the children to the necessary services, but also to seek those services for themselves and their families. Um, a lot of focus needs to happen on not only um, strengthening the services and the mechanisms to get to those services and access appropriate services um, for, for the families they're supporting, but also for themselves, because many of our caseworkers are living in communities that have reduced access to quality services uh, in the first place. So it's really ensuring that, that we as organizations, as agencies are providing as much support to our staff as we possibly can to, to protect their health and well-being as they're doing this important work. Thanks very much, Sarah. I think we're, we're just coming to, to the end of our time and we, we've managed to answer most of the questions um, in, the, in the chat box. And for those that we haven't, we will look at um, how we can either, either follow up with people as a group or um, also address them kind of through, through some of the, the next steps that are coming. Um, I wanted to, to encourage those of you who are on the line and still able to do, if you, um, if you wouldn't mind going back to menti.com and using the same code as you did before, there's just a question if you would like to feed back to us how, how you'd like to be engaged on the, the child protection minimum standards and family strengthening in the future, if you prefer to have more webinars or um, if you want to see short videos, case studies, things like that, um, we'd love to get a little bit of feedback for, from you. So if you're able to do that, please do. Um, we also wanted to highlight really briefly that there are a number of kind of follow-up steps to this webinar that are already planned. Um, so I think as you heard Ava and Sarah mention, uh, there's a follow-up webinar um, that's being planned for, for late May that's also on family strengthening where they hope to be able to share um, some more case studies and practical examples that um, have come about of adapting um, family strengthening in COVID-19 uh, from the child protection minimum standards end. Uh, we have a joint webinar with the community level child protection task force that's coming on the 25th of June, um, where we similarly will uh, do a presentation like this and share adaptations to COVID-19. For those who haven't heard of it or seen, the Alliance together with the Child Protection AOR is launching 
a child protection and COVID-19 community of practice, which will basically be kind of a live online forum where you can ask questions, share experiences, and access support. So please do have a look at the Alliance's uh, website if you're interested in participating in that. And, you know, you've got both uh, the email addresses for the Child Protection Minimum Standards Working Group and the Family Strengthening Task Force on your screen. Feel free to, to reach out to us directly. We would love to be in touch. And we are, from the Child Protection Minimum Standards end, we are continuing to support countries to roll out and implement the, the 2019 edition of the CPMS um, and can work with you collaboratively to see how to do that with some of the movement restrictions that are there. Just a welcome any kind of last comments from, um, from Sarah, Ava, or Kellen, uh, please feel free to jump in. Just a quick thank you to our colleague, Sandra, um, who was unable to join us today. Uh, she she um, was instrumental in uh, drafting the slides and preparing for this webinar. Uh, unfortunately, she could not join us today, but um, Sandra is a very valued colleague and uh, we're missing her today. Thanks very much, Sarah. Um, and any, any last words from, from Ava or Kellen? You're very welcome. No, not for now. Just as I, only what I said about the, if people would like to reach out to me regarding the uh, caregiver support intervention, uh, they can. I think my uh, contact is also on the invitation of the, of the webinar. Uh, yes, it is. Um, and with that, I've just, I've put up some of the results of the mentee that gives us kind of some, some idea of how colleagues would like to be engaged. Um, if you haven't, um, if you haven't inputted into that, please do feel free and we'll obviously um, share it with um, across colleagues uh, in the Family Strengthening Task Force and, and the CPMS Working Group. And other than that, I will um, just say thank you very much to all of you who took time out of your day to join us. Uh, we will post the recording of the webinar on the Alliance website um, and share some of the materials with all of the, those of you who've registered. Um, and to say thank you very much again. And I hope you and your families and friends are all healthy and safe.